How's it going, everyone? Uh, Ruri here, and welcome to another episode of the Love and Courage podcast. Thanks for tuning in. I look forward to seeing your thoughts and your comments on this episode. So uh, please do feel free to comment and share if you feel called to. And in this episode, which is going out on Facebook and YouTube, as well as through the main podcast audio platforms, I'm joined by the inspirational Donegal woman, Eski Britton. If you don't know Eski already, you're in for a treat. Eski is a scientist, surfer, writer, artist, and filmmaker with a PhD in environment and society. And her work explores the relationship between people, nature, and especially the sea. Uh, she's a lifelong surfer, and her parents taught her to surf when she was just four years old. How cool is that? And she channels her passion for surfing and the sea into social change work. This work is deeply influenced by the ocean and the lessons learned pioneering women's big wave surfing in particular in Ireland. And she's also been instrumental in introducing the sport of surfing to women in Iran, which led to her being invited to give an inspiring TEDx talk, which is called Just Add Surf. It's well worth checking out. So Iski's passionate also about facilitating creative and collaborative change, and she founded uh, the Like Water platform, which looks at innovative ways to reconnect people and nature, especially through the water. And she also designs and organizes a variety of leadership retreats, summits, and programs, including the annual uh, Wavemaker Retreat in Portugal. Iski now lives in County Mayo on the west coast of Ireland, and uh, she's working on her next book after just finishing her memoir, which we'll be talking about in this conversation. And um, before we do get started, um, I want to say a big thank you to some people, particularly all of you podcast patrons who support the Love and Courage podcast since it started, I think, just over three years ago now. It's kind of hard to believe. And I want to give a special shout out to new podcast patrons, Jared Boyle. Big thanks, Jared, and also to Sinead Bennett. Uh, welcome on board to you. So it's great to have, have your support. And to the regular monthly crew of Megan Brown, Davey Ward, uh, Victoria Nash, Pat Ryan, Jonathan Woods, Richard Lawson, Mary Brennan, Sophia Duffy, Laura Murphy, thank to you all, and also uh, Deborah Malloy, Cormac Anderson, Reezy Kelly, Derry O'Donnell, Ronan Brannigan, John Evoy, Olive Toey, Kieran McCormick, Dermot Kirsten, Dan McInerney, Jimmy Darcy, Niall Doherty, Dara McKeown, Davey Ward, and a few other donors and patrons who've chosen to remain anonymous. Thank you all. I hugely appreciate it. And if you do enjoy the podcast and want to chip in to support this work and all of my work, it takes just two minutes over at loveandcourage.org. If you want to chip in five euro, five dollar, 10, 20, a million, whatever it is, uh, if it's once off or monthly, it all matters. It's all appreciated and all goes directly into funding and fueling this work help get it out there and reach more people the podcast has listeners in over 50 countries all around the world so it, it makes its mark and certainly helps inspire and influence conversations so you're all part of that and i really appreciate all the support i couldn't do it without you and um you can support also non-monetarily by just sharing uh, all the old sharing stuff matters and it all helps and do leave a comment as i said and a big thanks to everyone who's been supporting the launch of this baby, my book, Hitching for Hope, A Journey into the Heart and Soul of Ireland. Uh, it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been an ideal time to launch a book in the course of a pandemic. So it has been a real community effort getting it out there into the world. You know, it did hit the top spot early on in the charts. Uh, but, you know, it, it is a challenge. It's a very real challenge. I'm working really hard on it. So all the support matters. Thanks for the reviews on Amazon, Goodreads, Google Books, and the lovely messages, emails, and social media posts. Uh, they all are massive, massively, genuinely appreciated. So thank you. And my next challenge now is to get the book launched in the UK, US, Canada, and Australia after my launch tours were all cancelled. So all ideas and help, all appreciated. And if you haven't read the book yet, you can find it in most bookstores and online retailers. And it's also available as an ebook and an audiobook, all of those things. And you can find out more about Hitching for Hope, A Journey into the Heart and Soul of Ireland. Go to hitchingforhope.com. So that is all the intro stuff taken care of. Let's get cracking into this episode. 
this conversation with the wonderful human being that is Eastkey Britain. Eastkey, thanks very much for joining me on the Love and Courage podcast. How are you keeping today? <laughs> Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. I'm sitting in the caravan in Mayo <laughs> after doing a bit of harvesting this morning. Cool. What, um, what part of Mayo are you in? in just outside Westport in Clue Bay. Uh, gorgeous. So yeah, as close to the sea as I can get. That's always my, my uh, <laughs> number uh, one rule. <laughs> how many meters away? Are we in meters, inches, feet, miles? Yeah, oh, well, you can kind of roll down the hill and then you can get straight into the sea for a swim. And then okay. the surfing beaches aren't too far away either. So, yeah. so you um, like if you wanted to go for a swim now, could you be in the water in like two minutes, one minute, half a minute? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, ten minutes walking. Yeah, yeah, ten minutes walking. That's pretty good. So you're in Blue Bay. That's just at the foot of Crow Patrick or the... The yeah, yeah. The the Reek Crowpatrick kind of just uh, right. The flank of it is rise, rises behind us. I'm on a farm here. Um, my boyfriend and his brother bought just uh, a year or two ago. So we're fully kind of off grid, trying to make a go of uh, <laughs> farming, uh, or market wow. gardening. Or he is, anyways. I, I just come and, and do pull a few weeds every now and again to clear the head. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you did more than that. Uh, <laughs> so it sounds kind of somewhat idyllic you're at the foot of a mountain you're at the sea there's islands there's surf nearby obviously you're growing food um is it as idyllic as it sounds or how, how is life in general there <laughs> yeah it does sound pretty i mean yeah i'm eternally grateful and i've just been deeply appreciative of having that outdoor space especially these last few months as you can imagine um but I mean, the reality is, yeah, we've, you know, we've been roughing it out in this rather small caravan for, for a couple of years now. And the winters aren't so kind in Ireland. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just a way of trying to do, do things a bit differently. Um, I don't know. What I find really interesting is just becoming even more aware of how finely tuned everything is, you know, with the with gardening I've never really I can't even really keep it's terrible I can't even really keep a house plant alive <laughs> my sister will back me up on that one <laughs> wow so I was a little bit like okay <laughs> so but this is really quite, this is really saying you're more a water water I'm than definitely more a water person than an earth <laughs> yeah. person that's, that's been fairly established <laughs> at this point yeah <laughs> so so I'm learning a new language definitely um but also just two things I'm really surprised in one way how incredibly easy it is like how accessible it is if we give ourselves a chance and a bit of time to just give it a go having like pretty much little or zero experience when it comes to growing food and having that connection with growing your own food that it's it's totally possible and then the other realization is that it's actually yeah it's it's just how finely tuned everything is to what's going on in terms of the weather and the climate and I always thought I was fairly switched on with the weather when it comes to surf but I'm always oriented towards what are the conditions going to be like at the beach or the coast or for the waves? Um, so I've never paid so much attention to like cloud cover and precipitation and rainfall levels. <laughs> um, so we had this great growth spurt coming out of lockdown early June and now everything's kind of a little bit dormant or stunted with all this rainfall and cloud cover. Uh, but it's all, it's all a process, which is, which is pretty cool. Okay, so so the, the level of rainfall isn't necessarily a good thing for growing? Like I don't want to turn this into an... Our, our, well, our, no, especially because it's not my area of expertise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're taking a whole <laughs> detour but yeah for someone that doesn't know a whole pile about it myself um i would imagine like the, the, the all the farmers were talking about the rainfall was clearly needed but uh, is there too much rainfall now this obviously being an irish summer as well well i'm i mean obviously i'm interested in in what's happening with our climate at large um and the impact of that and then in Ireland too we seem to be a little bit removed from realizing the changes already happening because of, of uh, climate change and, and the breakdown of what were regular weather patterns um, being totally disrupted so it's definitely seems to be like just the intensity of everything I'm okay. feeling yeah. you know even yeah. just from a personal experience like the intensity of the wind and the storms at the start of the year you could always get big storms at the start of the year and it's a great time for big wave surfing mm -hmm. um, from like a surfing perspective but it was just too it was just like the too muchness of it all okay and then we pretty much ran out of water um uh april early may uh so we had a, a drought for like six weeks with no rain and then, and then we've come out of that into just like a deluge um so it's interesting yeah 
of, of how it's yeah and I, it's hard to know how much of a pattern that actually is and are we more aware because actually I'm in one place for a lot longer than I mm-hmm. have been in yeah. a while yeah. Uh, yeah so there's all of that too yeah okay so so like I will first of all uh congrats on your book as well I've just finished reading it no and, uh, thanks yeah no yeah. it's fantastic I actually felt like I don't know. I felt like the the whole experience of the lockdown with COVID-19 and everything, obviously it has curtailed um, most or all of our travels. And as someone that is a little bit nomadic, at least suffer from itchy feet or enjoy itchy feet, it really like brought me on some travels and it just kind of tapped me back into some expansive thinking around... Mm. I don't know, just about life and adventure. And it doesn't even require one to go anywhere. It's just like the mindset of travel, the mindset of adventure. And I just thought you mm. captured it wonderfully. So well done. Yeah. Ah, thank you. <laughs> How was the experience of writing the book? Oh, it's so interesting. I mean, it's a, you know a thing or two about this as well. And then being at different stages of of the book writing process when the world has gone into all kinds of crazy is also interesting but i i actually wrote the book i always had this idea in my head i love writing um so that part of it i didn't i didn't find a challenge at all um but i always had this notion i i need to have a dedicated creative space so i need to like go away on a writing retreat like hermit myself away for weeks on end on an island (laughs) talk about idyllic but I mean, the reality was I was also working full time um, as a postdoc research fellow in Galway and uh, at this EU funded research project on oceans and human health. And so it's very different kind of mindset and intensity and an academic style of, of writing and, and gener- you know, creating new understanding and knowledge and stuff. But so in a way, the book writing ended up being this creative release for myself and so basically just chipped away at it for like a few hours here and there I try to create some kind of routine where I get up and have a couple of hours first thing in in the day and then I realized you know kind of two to four hours that's sort of my max in a way of what I what I could produce in, in any one day and then I did I did take myself off as last summer I made it out to actually Inish Turk uh, where I definitely did the the best <laughs> my best writing where most of the you know the core of it probably flowed out in a a week on that island I think it shows in in the book even uh the influence of those kind of spaces and places and the uh, impact of of the environment and that connection to water um yeah and then it's been a strange process like kind of trying to get a book finished as the whole book world is shutting down <laughs> oh man <laughs> so I, I then, then you were yeah. you know at the other end of it so I, i've been yeah I, I, so it was weird i kind of completed mm. it did all the editing and had it the, the whole thing ready to kind of go for the next stage um with mercier press and then it just all stopped so it was it's kind of this strange kind of uh, yeah kind of like a extended breath hold <laughs> yeah. so it's been nice to share it with you and have some other people read it you know it's still at that proofreading kind of stage right now but yeah so that makes it a bit more real so it's it's been been strange yeah oh well well done i, I it sounds like you, was that a like a one-year cycle or how when did it first begin yeah say it well by the time it's due to come out now in january 2021 that'll be two years yeah okay Okay. Uh, all in so and kind so of a year and a half was yeah. that the original plan january 21 or was it due around now or soon due in september yeah okay, okay so it's yeah. not a big big difference no. yeah 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 brilliant yeah. okay and do you want to d- d- just tell people the name of the book if it's been finalized yeah i probably should yeah <laughs> so it's called salt water in the blood uh by mercier press and i suppose it's the story of it's Certainly it's part memoir and my own life philosophy around my connection with the sea through surfing and also that kind of looking, I suppose, exploring that more universal connection we have with water and, and what is it about water um, in terms of its effect on our, our psyche, our healing and, and how we connect with others. So there's a lot in, my, in terms of my travels around that kind of cross-cultural connection and experiences in particular of women um, well, in, a, in a way, it's that more feminine perspective of, of the ocean as well and, and a sport like surfing. So that more, um, by feminine, I mean 
uh, not just female sort of lens, but also the the experience of surfing as a feminine kind of yeah. process, right? You know, yeah, it's not yeah. just going out there and, and conquering, controlling these monstrous waves, for example, but just what it feels like to be fully in our bodies when we're immersed in something like water and that whole kind of sensory experience and, and, and that whole part of it too. Yeah, I got that. I was actually really struck by uh, one passage where you, you did refer to the, the kind of classical, uh, like the guy who was going to get out there and smash or slay the wave, like conquer the dragon kind of thing. Whereas the more feminine perspective might be to embrace the flow state or to, to become more immersive and whole with the ocean. I, I mean, I'm paraphrasing in a disastrous way here. Yeah. So buy the book for a much more articulate <laughs> description but it but it, it it did capture me like it it there was i don't know look it, from a world view perspective you know like i don't know i'm i'm also fascinated by the whole spectrum of masculine and feminine and and where where the scales end and where does yeah. that what does that mean even for gender that it's not as black and white as as we may have been led to believe but certainly um and, and it's not that masculine uh, is necessarily a negative as well, because there there is a massive role. No, there. no. Like, so it's about the, the yin and yang, isn't it? And yeah. the, the tau of balance. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think surfing is my way to explore it and that I really feel that brings out the tension between these sort of dynamic forces at play. So it's definitely about how do you find, it's not about do dominance of one force over the other. And so surfing is a combination of, obviously it's really like physically demanding and there's that strength and commitment to like go on a wave. But then there's also at the same moment, this sort of surrender and letting go to this force that's so much greater than you. And um, yeah, so there's that always that tension between sort of the, the risk taking element and then also the need to keep yourself safe <laughs> yeah, yeah, in the water yeah, and so yeah. it's, it's kind of that interplay of those those different tensions that it's that I think it's almost just recognizing that they're there and and it's about that yeah it isn't it isn't a choice that we have to make between one and one and the other and that's kind of something I'm I'm sort of re-realizing um was right now over these these few months too it's strange to sort of come out of having written a book and then to have all this contemplative time afterwards uh, although it's been pretty busy for me too yeah um another part of your book that captured me was uh i think it was towards the end but there's a few references but particularly uh i felt uh intrigued by to learn a bit more about your grandmother um who mm. first brought the surfboards to this is like the foundation myth story of eski and surfing i think where where your grandmother brings some surfboards home from a holiday in california to your family home is it was that in the 70s yeah, uh, that, that, was, that, that strikes me that it would be uncommon at the time for anybody's grandmother to be on holidays in California for a start. Never well, mind no, bringing probably, surfboards home. <laughs> it's probably even more extraordinary. So it was, yeah, Mary Britton, she, with the, her husband, Vinny, my grandfather, they kind of bought this uh, small, at the time, it was a small house, got guest house uh, at Rasnaula Beach that went on to become the Sand House Hotel. And that was in the 60s. So she and she was also kind of working for Fall to Ireland, so our, our tourism board. And that's what she was doing in California. She was promoting tourism in Ireland in like the late 60s wow. in the US. So she was touring the US, kind of like drumming up this, creating this whole new um I suppose customer base for for her hotel but also for ireland making that link between america and, and ireland in terms of of tourism really um, um so that in itself i suppose was really pioneering and then being in california late 60s in sort of surf culture speak that's like the whole era of the kind of renaissance of modern surfing you have the beach boys and gidget and malibu and she actually stayed at malibu at a hotel there I remember her telling me the story not long before she passed. Um, and I, I always wish I kind of, at the time, I was so familiar with the story in one way that I, I love, I would have loved now to go back and ask her more about it. But she remarked how she stayed at this hotel in Malibu, saw these waves in front of the hotel and were like, oh, we've got waves like that in, in Rasnaila. <clears throat> and it's the first time she saw surfing as well. And I don't know what like sparked for her, how she made the link that she wanted then to get, she ordered uh, a couple of surfboards and, and got them 
shift into Ireland and, and God knows how that was even possible. Uh, but I think our intention really at the time was to have them for tourists or you know, to put up in the hotel or whatnot. But she had five boys, including my dad, um, and four of them all got into surfing. So they're going mad. My dad was 12 at the time uh, when, the, when these surfboards first arrived. <laughs> And they dragged them out onto a Snarla beach, these big, like kind of 10 foot tanks of things now that would probably be impossible for me to carry. <laughs> and that's kind of how it all began, this, this love affair with surfing that's now become intergenerational in our family. So from my grandparents to my dad to myself and then the next generation, I just have my sister had a baby girl last summer and she's already been in, for, in the sea for her first swim. So you could definitely say it's in the blood. Yeah. <laughs> It seems like it's a mandatory family line there. Um, <laughs> and and your, your parents, uh, just reading through the book as well, like your, your parents like, have been great surf buddies for you as well. I, I was struck by um, also y- your mother bringing you to Hawaii for a bit of a pilgrimage when you're around 15 or something. That must be pretty epic. Yeah. Yeah, that was amazing. Um, I suppose a, a big part of my connection too was this, with surfing um it was the recognition i suppose of that kind of what comes up is this ancestry and and that's what the history of it but and the influence of those early pioneers and so we have very little access to that kind of you know the way surf media now is just fully accessible we can see what's going we can watch a surf session live on the other side of the planet but then it was really through surf magazines and of course all the surf magazines were all of guys uh surfing in the likes of hawaii california australia um but at the same there was also this woman's publication that came out in the early kind of early to mid 90s called Wahine magazine and so i got a subscription to that and that was my access into like how other women are surfing in the world um and my only insight into it and i think one of the first issues i got was this copy of the i talk about that as well in the book of a hawaiian surfer called rel sun still considered kind of the queen of, of Hawaiian surfing uh, today. And she was one of the you know early pioneers of the women's surfing movement, getting recognized as a professional sport and actually getting, you know, um, pay, <laughs> prize money and contests and, uh, and things like that. But also I think she just had this real embodiment of what would be considered the alo- aloha spirit in Hawaii. So the Hawaiian culture around this, um, of love essentially the Irish equivalent to gra and that sense of, of of giving but this I think just for me it was exposure to uh a, a woman in surfing and then a woman in surfing you know who was Hawaiian and this embodiment of grace both power and grace riding these really powerful waves but in a really feminine way um that isn't often portrayed in surf media um and so there was, yeah, I just was really taken with her story and just the sense of um, how she, all through her life she was always passing on this love of her sea connection and then exploring the sea in all these different ways, both as, uh, you know, as just an all round water woman. Um, and that just had, it's amazing how huge an influence this little, like, you know, piece in a magazine that a, a you know an 11 year old gets a hold of and then it stays with me my whole life so it just highlights for me now the importance of that kind of the early influencers mm. uh, on mm. young girls and the importance of mentors and going to Hawaii was this sense of um was reconnecting with that um having never got a chance to meet Rel who who died of cancer when she was age only 47 in in I think 1997 uh, but her, so she has such a legacy, you know, and then going and surfing. I think that was the other thing that still stays really powerful for me. Going to her home break where she grew up um, in, in Makaha on the west side of Oahu. Again, um, a really kind of very marginalized part of Oahu and the Hawaiian Islands um, with a very uh, large sort of native Hawaiian uh, community and population and also this incredible surf break uh, that's, that's really kind of raw and powerful and so with this sense of being able to connect through time and space with with someone else um, because we're sharing the same waves if that makes sense mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so as a young woman it was definitely a huge rite of passage. Yeah it, it also <clears throat> speaks to the power of uh, each other's stories to influence and inspire others you know you never necessarily know who you're going to inspire um at any given time you know and and maybe there's you know there's maybe there's a responsibility there but there's also like i don't know like the 
the, the, I, I guess what I'm trying to tune into is the concept of mentorship as well. Um, you know, when we put yeah. our voices out there, we, we are having an influence, whether a positive or a negative or, or even a neutral. But I think particularly when I'm thinking about younger people these days, I'm thinking about like, where are their influences and, and who are, who's speaking to them? And, mm. you know, I'm politically, I have a lot of concerns about who's speaking to young people right now, particularly in the, in the, in the whole emergence of the far right and fascism and so on. But, but conversely, there's, there's always good people um, seeding ideas of possibility and alternative visions. And there was another woman mentioned in your book, um, was really kind of struck by her. Obviously, there's no photos in the, in the version of the book that I have anyway, uh, but Linda, Linda Cosby. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so like you were maybe like 11 or 10 or 11 or younger, and she's, she's this free, free-spirited American surf woman who's camped out in East Key. In, in yeah, Sligo. my namesake wave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, like, yeah. I was just really struck by this Linda person and, and imagine what her life was. And she's kind of roaming around Ireland, camping out, surfing waves. And, and there you're this kind of young, somewhat local uh, woman that, that's been inspired by her lifestyle. And, and then you've gone on to kind of see that in other potentially young women and young men as well. I don't think these influences are necessarily gender constrained, but can you talk no. to me about Linda? Yeah, that's so interesting. You picked up on that. And it really wasn't until writing the book, having that chance to reflect on a like, kind of following those threads through of like, well, where, you know, how has my path been shaped in terms of my relationship with the sea and um, what I value most about it? Like, where did it come from? And obviously with my parents instilling that, that passion and, and love for something like that. But also when you're a kid, it's really important to have you're at that stage too I think when it was Linda was around you know the sort of 9 to 13 um, age and they're really those kind of real identity forming years you're again it's that change from like childhood into becoming like a teenager and and you kind of so there is that tendency to really not want to listen to your parents I suppose <laughs> and that's when it's really important to have those other mentors yeah um so yeah, but then my, my dad like would always take me down to East Eden to go and surf, which is brilliant. But I kind of just, I always stayed and hung out with Linda and it seemed like the most normal thing at the time because that's just how it was. And it wasn't until looking back, I was like, wow, yeah, that was quite a, a life she lived um, and how much I sort of admired her for that, for that sense of freedom and independence and to be able to travel and also move with the season. So she chose to be, you know, in Ireland, it, in the summertime and to catch the the kind of waves that she wanted and just to live I suppose that ability to to live a life uh, that's totally um I suppose for her living living her passion but also then looking back and realizing the sacrifices that come with that you know it's like yeah you're alone with yourself in the van um a lot of the time too and um yeah this that in experience of I often feel it too, and especially maybe it's a West Coast of Ireland thing, I don't know, but you get that feeling of remoteness and loneliness. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and, and then also at the same time for me, feeling this really keen sense of belonging and connection to the, the more than human. So like to, you know, not, not needing people around me in order to feel connected um, and and not alone I suppose so every time mm. I'm in the sea I wouldn't feel any sense of loneliness you know what I mean so I wondered mm. if that was the same for Linda yeah yeah like culturally I guess the, the the dominant culture that we're mostly brought up in is one of kind of company entertainment distraction where it doesn't necessarily foster or promote um silence or solitude yeah you know, so yeah, I, I, I'm kind of struck by that. And do you think that there's something innate in people that are drawn to surfers that that are they're seeking that, or do you think surfing gives them that? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I find that was hard for me to answer because I don't, I don't really remember in terms of my blueprint life mm, before surfing. Yeah, there just yeah. wasn't any. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it's it's definitely 
that's sort of an innate part, a part of it for me. But I do know people then who've come to surfing maybe later in life and why they're drawn to it is, is really interesting. Um, and even this kind of return, as I see it, a return to the sea in a way, I feel it's happening in Ireland. There's more of a shift, like even with people uh, going swimming and this kind of rise of like wild swimming or, or uh, cold water swimming. Um is really lovely to see and often that's happening for people who are you know adults now maybe haven't been in the sea at all since they were kids um and so there's this vulnerability um that we kind of rediscover in our adulthood that's actually really healthy by going into the sea again uh so there's something about that there's definitely this draw uh, and pull on the sea for for humans i think that's just natural um and it's both it's interesting because it's kind of a paradox there's also a huge amount of fear and danger and risk you know it's a risky environment uh it's not where we feel our you know most at home you have to hold your breath we can't breathe underwater um you know we have to give up a lot to be in in the water uh but at the same time if you look through human history we're just always drawn towards it and and how much we've benefited from that relationship yeah and particularly as an island nation i mean i i i don't have a sense of us fully embracing the sea as a as a country despite our history and heritage it seems like also an innate kind of paradox or a contradiction in terms um, but i think what you refer to there is the the so-called wild swimming um seems to be a call back if you like um and i do you think there's like a, mm. a, a rising consciousness of like maritime culture and sea culture and perhaps that's the the academic and, and research work you're involved in as well is kind of amplifying that as well. Yeah, sometimes I'm worried maybe I'm just in this, occupy this bubble, you know. <laughs> um, but I, I definitely think it's, and even globally, it seems to be more of a trend. Um, what's interesting too is around this this whole time of, I suppose, the lockdown that we went through and... Two, two things I noticed with that was like this, obviously this, this almost reawakening or realization of, of what, what, what's always been around us in terms of nature and our connection to nature and being part of it again. And then, you know, noticing like things, lots of comments and noticing like bird song and the first primroses yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. But it was almost also at the same time as we sort of woke up to that and the joy of that is also this kind of almost grief or the more tragic aspect of we realizing at the same time how numb and disconnected we've become that it was mm. it took a lockdown a global pandemic for us to slow down enough to actually realize this power of this connection that's all, always there and how much we'd separated ourselves from it and then as we began to sort of um when i say we i'm talking you know here in ireland and in the western world and and our more urbanized cultures because of course it's not you know, the same everywhere um, for all peoples, in particular indigenous cultures have maintained this really powerful connection. Uh, but somehow this huge, you know, this, this real separation has happened in our culture and Western society of disconnect, um, I think for lots of different reasons. And then realizing as we, we begin to reconnect and really value it, all the other aspect of just how much damage we've done to it. And realizing that at the same time, you know, we become aware of bird song, kind of remembering, although it seemed really loud, I think it's because we were much quieter <laughs> rather than there being more birds. You know, even things the last few years of there's being far fewer swallows, uh, huge, you know, murmurations of, of birds blocking out the sky being extremely rare, if, if not almost non-existent. So it's, and I think that's not a bad thing. I think, um, I'm I'm hoping <laughs> that that feeling of of loss and grief, at least that I feel as well, will also move us uh, to want to act as well and to take greater responsibility. Um, but it's it's an interesting and challenging time. Yeah, like you refer to a feeling of loss and grief. I I wonder though, do does everyone feel that, or you know, and you know i think mary reynolds referred to the the concept of shifting baseline syndrome whereby yeah we don't necessarily know and the next generation doesn't know what they never had kind of thing so that if nobody's a child has never seen a murmuration of birds then they they can't lose it but i wonder then you've got like 
tens of thousands of years of evolution that there's something in us that perhaps knows that something is not right. And uh, this is going beyond any parliament or policy level that like the, the, the order of things is completely out of balance. And if you look at the whole realm of mental health and depression and anxiety and particularly anxiety, um, it strikes me that one of the bigger missing links in the conversation is, is our relationship with nature in that. Mm. And I think it's emerging mm. as a, as a real time discussion, but certainly like in, in the main mental health messaging and campaigns, it's like the, the, the most you often hear is like, go for a walk in the park. And it's I like, know. it's much bigger than that, isn't it? <laughs> oh yeah. It's, it's, it's huge. I mean, I love what you, I listened to the podcast with Mary Reynolds and I loved it. And what she said about, um, mirroring, uh, and I really feel that that's such a powerful way to look at it. This concept of how our health and society is mirroring the health of the planet. Like those things aren't separate. The, you know, the fact that we're in this ecological crisis and climate breakdown isn't separate from the fact we're also experiencing a mental health crisis. Um, that are, you know, the, our, this notion that our inner psychological and emotional states are mirroring the outer living world because we're not separate, even though we've done our, you know, damnness to try to separate ourselves. Like that's impossible. Um, and I think that causes, it has to cause psychological distress as well as the fact of, um, I am, it was actually, um, Susie was involved in Electric Picnic uh, a couple of years ago in this event around can we be well in a sick sea, you know, and I, I just that's always stayed with me as well because we can't be well in a sick sea, you know, and, and this other kind of thinking as well around even how we approach something like the environmental crisis, it's looked at in, in isolation and totally in isolation to our mental health crisis and vice versa. Mm. Um, but another, um, favorite writer of mine, Robin Wall Kimmerer, writes about how if we restore the land, we restore ourselves. And I know that's something like Mary Reynolds was really talking about as well. And for me, it would be if we restore the ocean, we'll really restore ourselves <laughs> because that's the source of all life. You know, water is literally life. And somehow we've just really forgotten, um, forgotten that. Um, and as you're saying, again, we're looking at something like with, with mental health and how that's going to only become an increasing issue as well um, and the impact of what we're experiencing collectively. So that kind of like trauma work, what's really absent in those discussions is, is um, our relationship with nature and as part of nature. I was listening to um, a trauma summit online got amazing access to all these <laughs> summits all of a sudden um, and it was it was fascinating but there was it was almost entirely absent was the this the aspect of our our relationship um, with nature and I really feel that if we don't restore our relationship with the natural world that we'll actually never be whole you know because that's a huge part of us um, mm -hmm. and it just feels like it's the real it's it's the real missing not even missing link I just think it's foundational to everything else yeah yeah it's 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 like a fundamental blind spot in the conversation or something i i i suspect a lot of it has to do with the particular training that goes on in in psychology or psychotherapy or whatever and speaking of psychotherapy your mother i met your mother uh nc and she she's is she a psychotherapist or a psychologist psychotherapist psychotherapist yeah, yeah. and she specifically has done work around trauma hasn't she from what i understand yeah. 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 So, so this kind of, and your, and your father, I should say, is an artist as well. So like there, there is a kind of rivers <laughs> flowing into the sea here as with us all. Like, I mean, the role mm -hmm. of anyone's parents is, is significant, but not always defining either. Um, but can, can you talk to me a little bit about her specific influence in your work or your thinking and your relationship with her now? Because when I met you at a Electric Picnic Festival a couple of years ago, mm. um, you struck me as like sisters, you know, like more than <laughs> mother and daughter. And that's not to say it isn't a mother and daughter relationship, but it, it struck me as like great kind of friendship there as well. Yeah, that's been an amazing relationship. And we we are really like um, best buddies. So there's definitely that, yeah, that more, almost sometimes the other sister vibe than mother-daughter. Um, 
She's also and very cool anyway with the leather yeah, jacket. She's, yeah, let's be honest. She's super cool, yeah. <laughs> She'll be stuck there. <laughs> Yeah, and I, my mom's work is incredible. She's been in, in psychotherapy for, well, probably over you know, 20, 30 years working around women's health and in particular in trauma and, and domestic violence, mental health. Um, and then, yeah, and it's interesting to see the way the more I'm going into the work of, you know, shifting from this intuitive knowing of, of the, in particular, the ocean's capacity to heal and our you know, immersion in water and the therapeutic benefit to beginning to look at sort of the evidence base behind that. It's like, you know, science is starting to catch up <laughs> with those more ancient philosophies and belief systems around connection to nature, in particular water. Um, and, and yeah, I, I just feel like, yeah, there's this gap here around, around trauma. It's actually a really exciting space. But for someone like, say, like mom in, in the health service in Ireland, is very excited by the possibilities of it as well, but there's just real resistance um, to even to, to bring in any form of change in terms of the practice of something like, let's say like talk therapy um, or, you know, this change within something like, like the health service. Um, and, and so what I, I think I think the change has to happen on on the it is happening on the periphery in this edge space and it's like trying to <laughs> creep it in um whilst at the same time um maybe it's also possible to do to for it to do come from um I don't know at a policy level and that's at least what I was trying to do in, with the research in Galway with a project called Near Health so it was looking at it was funded by the EPA our Environmental Protection Agency and the Health Service so acknowledging yeah there is a link between the healthy environment and healthy communities and how do we better understand that in the context of ireland and encourage greater engagement um with the outdoors and nature for the benefit of health and well-being and uh so i mean that would be interesting to see what comes out of that um in terms of actual impact but the relationship with mum actually allows me to do what i love best so it's I'm in academia, but I kind of bridge different worlds. So I'm most interested in how do you take this knowledge and understanding we have and what does that look like when it's applied in practice? And then mum is someone who's really great at just taking it and going, right. And, and immediately seeing how that works in a, in a real, you know, lived experience and context. And then I, I apply it in, in my own work as well around in practice, working with women um, around I suppose what you could call empowerment, but building confidence and self-connection um, and a stronger relationship with our bodies and each other through something like uh, the sea and being in water. So that's like the medium um, almost through this ability to connect with nature it helps us take us out of our sort of everyday thought patterns. It's just re really interesting process that happens. Mm. Um, so I've seen that in different contexts. Like I've, I've done that kind of work around the world um, in, with women in Iran, for example, like real cross-cultural work in Papua New Guinea. And, and I'm seeing other initiatives kind of um, spark and, and take off as well that, that does seem to be kind of spreading. Um, I think, did I ramble on lots there? No, no, not at all. That's the whole yeah. point. That's the whole yeah. point. Yeah. We're supposed um, to ramble on podcasts. Great. <laughs> the... Uh, the, the 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 connection with nature there like there seems like almost like full cycle literally when we talk about um the influence of the moon in your mm. in your thinking and your work and, and you obviously have written about it now in the book as well um and particularly around like you have a slight aversion to the word period i believe from what i remember of the book or, or just the, the use <laughs> of the word period and not maybe understanding the full breadth of the cycle and the menstrual cycle and connection with the moon and then i just fascinated that the moon is just synonymous and, and integral to the ocean and it and then your particular interest in women's health and women's empowerment it just feels like a full cycle in 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 all of it and um, can you talk a little bit about all of that oh wow yes in, in, <laughs> all of that there for the next two hours i'll just leave you to it yeah, well, I think cause I, I was interested how that, even with the process of writing, I had to do a few things to sort of get out of my own way, if that makes sense, you know, and, and this really also a version to sort of write about myself and feeling like, how do you do that in a way that doesn't come across like totally narcissistic and hopefully it hasn't. Um, but 
in a way, yeah, yeah. So it's finding, again, writing about, um, I, guess I suppose in a way, a lot of my experience of surfing and learning to surf wasn't, uh, say, about learning the skill of surfing, like how you go to surf school now and learn how to stand up on a surfboard. But it was learning about the whole ecosystem and how it all interacts. Uh, so like the weather patterns and the storm systems and low pressures thousands of miles away and and depending on how they form and interact with the wind and the sea temperature and generating these waves and then how that interacts with what stage is the tide going to be at based on where where the moon is at in in the it's just yeah so all of that always blew my little mind when I was a kid um and I, I suppose in a way I didn't even realize I was absorbing all that kind of knowledge of these cyclical processes that create what seems like this, this magic, like a totally unique wave that if I then position myself and I'm in the right place at the right moment, I can catch right before it sort of dissipates. And then, um, go, you know, where does that energy go? And I think in part, the energy obviously goes back into the sea energy goes into the shore and helps shape the coastline. And then the energy, I, I definitely absorb some of it. <laughs> At least that's what it feels like. You know? um, so that was my way to sort of realize I always had this understanding of cycles, but it was around tides and the moon. And as a woman, it took until my you know, late 20s, early 30s to realize, wow, <laughs> hang on a minute. <laughs> I also have a cycle that syncs with these natural cycles. Um, and it was, it was in one way just total, you know, total revelation and wow. And then at the same moment, also just a shock and horror that how do I not know this? And of course I did, you know, to a certain extent, but it was more the knowing led to this, this to, yeah, like the, to the need to suppress it because it was getting in the way of how I was supposed to perform, how I was expected to be, especially as a professional athlete, um, of, you know, this period getting in the way. And in particular, when you're like swimming and surfing, it's just like, <laughs> no, it just, it's like, it's messy, you know? Um, and there was just no, I had no real, when I look at it now, I realize there's so much power in that more intimate connection with, with your body by understanding something like your cycle and, and that all, all humans, we have these biorhythms, these cycles, so men and women, um, because we are a natural species. So you have the circadian rhythm where we're influenced by the dark and the light. Um, and increasingly we're losing that, our experience of natural light and that's affecting our sleep and so on. So that's not surprising. And then as women, we're losing our connection to our menstrual cycle through, through drugs and medication and, um, and yeah. And then also not just that, but also the story we're told about it and the language that gets used. It's really negative. It's taboo. It's dirty. And that's our bodies. You know, we're telling our bodies this mm. really <laughs> negative story. Um, and it's a part of ourselves that's unwanted. So I think in terms of our, you know, when even when it comes to health and women's body issues, this has to be um, all connected, you know? And now my experience of, I feel like I'm able to bring together this experience of, as a surfer, a connection to the moon and natural cycles and my experience of my own. So what I feel now is this ability to bring together my understanding and experience of natural cycles with the moon and tide as a surfer with this understanding of my own uh, inner cycle, menstrual cycle as a woman. And it's just such a powerful way for me to feel self-connected. It's like a full body mindfulness practice. And it also, the more I kind of, I guess, tap into an understanding of my own rhythms, it allows for there to be this, this flux, this ebb and flow. It means I don't have to exhaust and overstretch myself constantly because I know there's a time really when my body is calling my calling me into myself to rest recharge and I have a different quality to my energy and then there's a time then when I really sort of I'm ready to sort of be seen and be out in the world and that was a huge breakthrough for me in terms of a hey, managing my time and energy also helping to create better boundaries um, and it excites me now because I think 
if we could tap into this more you know cyclical approach to how we live how we work uh, i think it would really help us break out of um the silos that we're in and really recognize those interconnections and um allow for thing there to be this ebb and flow which i think we also began to realize when things slowed down um for some people at least during lockdown um and just this different relationship in a way this different relationship with time came about through this connection with cycles yeah i i'm i'm delighted you brought up the the whole ebb and flow and and the idea of you know stepping back from exhaustion and being overstretched because to be honest, when I when I look through your website, I'm like, how how does she do all this stuff? Uh, when does she sleep? Because um, you you know you also have a you're still a postdoc, by the way. Are you you're still doing? You're you're essentially a researcher in academia. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you're doing that, and you've about forty five other projects on the side, which is. <laughs> Oh, yeah, maybe. And, and, yeah, you just wrote a book and you're, you're doing media interviews and you're, you're obviously surfing, but maybe the surfing is the inbuilt restoration. I don't know, but yeah. like, do you, do you suffer from burnout? Have you, like, is this a, something, a dance for you? Yes, definitely a dance. Um, so and it's a, it's the constant i miss i come into a place of accepting this it, it's a process and it's about developing constantly developing my own practice rather than like reaching or attaining <laughs> any sense of like balance you know like oh i've nailed it now i've got the perfect rhythm in my life uh that that's actually not what it's about at all um so it's just constantly this you know reconnecting with nature and tapping into what grounds me but often having to continuously remind myself of that. So the more I do this work, the more aware I become of what it is that does grind me <laughs> and allowing for more of that. Uh, and that luckily is a huge part to do with my relationship with the sea. So when I go surf, that's my, um, that's what nourishes me. And funnily enough, when I started like, in Galway with the research there five years ago, I kind of moved back after being very nomadic and traveling um, around an awful lot and being really quite restless to this sort of sense of homecoming and there's no surf in Galway like in the immediate mm. sort of coastline quite sheltered and I actually reconnected with sea swimming so I mean I swam my whole life uh, obviously and I competed competitively which I think that was the thing that actually killed it, the the buzz for me and so the association was very like competitive performative chlorine swimming pools um but then this immersion in the sea was like almost discovering the sea in a whole new way again for myself. So as a surfer, and then I, I'm also kind of researching this as well, um, which is, I just geek out on it a bit too much. But so my point being is actually everything I do is all connected around how do we better understand our relationship with water and its effect on us as humans and how can we restore that relationship um, so that it better benefits the a healthier um, ocean and also healthier humans. So it seems like I'm doing a lot, but that's kind of the, the one narrative through it all. Um, and then for me personally, I experience it all the time. So going sea swimming in Galway and having this immersion in a part of the coastline um, allowed me to actually see the sea in a different way. So it was like this perspective shift. And then I wasn't in a wetsuit. I was just, you know, bare skin, swimming, and it's just this different kind of freedom. Um, and then I began to like look, seek out different parts of the coast that I would have ignored because there wasn't any waves. <laughs> mm. um, and then through my work, I've had lots of conversations with people who, you know, use the sea in different ways, but how, what, why and what we're drawn to. And some of us looking for those camera corners and some of us looking for the more wave exposed ones. And yeah, I, I just think there's just so much possibility there in terms of a reconnection, uh, coming back home to our bodies. Uh, and even that feeling in Ireland, say with the swimming, is this sense, obviously, the cold water. Do you get that? You can get cold water shock, which is it's not, it's not good. But gradual immersion and build up to it over time it, um, does create this like full body experience and immediately takes us out of our heads because we have something like 
30 trillion cells in our body that are pretty much ignited as soon as we're in water and they're all speaking to each other all at once. Um, so it was those kinds of lived experiences at the same time as I was sort of researching the science behind how does water change us now. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you're you're really um, making me want to um, go jump in the sea now. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> and to be honest with you, I've been ignoring it um, a bit too much recently. And I think there's something, um, you know, where I, I certainly did, 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 I suffer from the whole like too many projects syndrome. And so many of those happen to be online or you, you end up online for whatever reason. And mm -hmm. there's something about being online that I feel like is dullifying, you know, it, it, it just really like numbs your being and it takes the sparkle out of your eyes and leaves you a bit sort of almost like zombie-esque, you know, and, and like, you know, there, there, there's my phone and like, I, I definitely um, I suffer from this. So I'm not like preaching to anybody about being in any way superior, but there's definitely when I get into the sea, it, it like destroys all of that static energy or negative energy or whatever it is. And like almost reminds the whole biology, mm. the whole system that it's a human, that you're human and that the world is out there. So I, I can definitely see the, um, the well, I felt, felt the impact, but I, I certainly see the systemic potential whereby you've like hundreds of thousands of people in any given moment in Ireland and, and certainly tens or hundreds of millions of people globally that are suffering from like what, what has been pathologized as, as a mental health, but it's really a, a lot of it's about being removed from being human. And, and then we're brought into this yeah. kind of funnels of whether it be therapy or medication and it's not to take away from the role of any of those, but there are ways to prevent that numbness occurring as well, or to remind ourselves of the aliveness, which can be the, the medication in some ways. I don't know, like it's, it's, it's difficult to speak about these things when you're not uh, a medic and then it can get dismissed because it's not grounded yeah. in research and so on and so, so forth, which is why we have yeah. kind of PhD scholars like yourself and others. And, but it, it's almost like we need a convergence now of, yeah. of, of all the variety of uh, medical and scientific thinking to come together. And there, there's my rant over, sorry. Yeah, no, but I think it's, it's hugely important what you said. Like, there's a massive opportunity right now to bring more of this into, you know, public policy, public health discourse. That's where it needs to be. It shouldn't be fringe. And we need this sort of like global restoration when it comes to our relationship with nature that isn't like itty bitty and piecemeal. And there are really strong like emerging trends around like surf therapy, ocean therapies that are starting to be prescribed. Um, and in a way it's almost like we need a new language to, to around and how we create a culture around that because there's an issue around medicalizing nature and turning it into obviously another commodity of what it can do for us mm. and it's not like you can reduce it into like you know a prescription pill i don't think we ever should but um you know as an integral part to how we look at our health as a whole it has to be that has to be there um and it's foundational and it's a how do you and then it's a how do you create a language where you can speak to people who are in like public health, for example. And, and there is actually really strong evidence and we're really trying to like build that and get that out there as well around things like with, with immersion in the sea and with water, its impact on things on mental health in particular and in depression. Um, what happens at a neurological level, um, physiological in our bodies and in a way it can be captured uh, and another way obviously it then it's the challenge is you're dealing with this incredibly fluid dynamic complex environment that shouldn't really be reduced to its parts you know um, mm -hmm. and so in a way that speaks to well how do we look at a, a more holistic system and approach to health um, and I think there's a real opportunity for that mm -hmm. now we've realized actually in again this mirroring we've ended up creating um, this 
pandemic because of how shockingly awful and damaged our relationship is with the environment. Mm. And I hate even saying the environment. There we go, language straight away, like creating the separation that it's like this sort of backdrop to our lives rather than it being this sort of living, um, breathing life force that we're just tangled up with. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, what's coming to mind is um, the notion that we talk about the Department of Health and government where, where it, you know, it's often said it, it's the Department of Ill Health, actually. What it's talking about is illness a lot of the time or what it's responding to is illness. Whereas I think there is a, a pretty serious move towards wellness and well-being where that should be the fundamental kind of currency and that, that should... Yeah that should kind of dictate the script for everything. And even where um, economics are concerned, you know, like just because something is kind of economically beneficial to a country or to a GDP or GNP, it might be actually quite, uh, it might be quite damaging to people's well-being or to the overall well-being. So we need new kind of, metrics you know and I, I think you're seeing some of this come into play around the coronavirus and the pandemic whereby you kind of have economic measures being taken but they're actually damaging health and vice versa so yeah. it's, it's kind of like the the need for holistic thinking all around it, outside of silos is, is really what's needed is is kind of equality where the department or the minister for health for e the minister for finance isn't in any way superior to the minister for health and the Minister for Culture, for that matter, isn't out on the fringe. And you see that all the time with art and the, the role of art, that it's put out on the fringe as, a, yeah, that's, we all like a bit of music and a bit of art, but let's put them over there. Whereas they are all yeah. like integral parts of a functioning ecosystem. Um, but, but talking about art kind of brings your father to mind. And uh, obviously I was at his um, launch of his last book in Ballyshannon and um, with his art exhibition and That's I right. just, yeah. like I don't know I was kind of really struck by uh, the imagery and um, I, I could really feel all of these things coming out in your book I was trying to like I suppose my mind wanted to categorize and pigeonhole your book because that's what what we're kind of trained to do to some extent <laughs> but, but it, there's so many different things going on like you've got poetry in the book like punctuated with poetry there's like art there's psychology there's surfing there's academia there's spirituality there's women's health like there's a whole bunch of stuff going on but can you talk to me about like art in your life and and mm. maybe perhaps your the hmm. link between your dad and art and and then where that leaves you with art and painting and whatever but. yeah because you've captured me at an interesting time because I've actually, sorry, I, I'll still keep a foot in the door with academia, but I actually like finished um, with my, my time at Galway and kind of decided it was before this whole <laughs> pandemic thing happened. I had intentionally decided my contract on the, the Oceans and Human Health project I was on with the European Union, it, the, it finished at the end of May. And I intentionally decided I was going to take what I kind of call a creative leave of absence. <laughs> um, and I, I was thinking of, I think the reason why I did that is that I began to feel like, I mean, there's, there's huge changes that are needed, I think, within academia as well as, as a culture. But it was just that intensity that the the relentless sort of pace of, of always on hyper productivity um, that I would just find myself resisting more and more. Um, and then wanting to create this just like breathing space. I could almost feel it in my chest. It would like build. Um, and especially in, in the last year or two, I thought, okay, <laughs> you know, I entered academia because I, I thought it was a space where you could really, you know, reflect, critically think, um, read, uh, write. <laughs> it's hardly time for any of that. Um, and I, I think I decided I needed to create that space and, and in a way leap into the unknown again. Um, so I almost felt like, how do I put this? Like my imagination was under threat. <laughs> my um create 
that creative energy really wasn't being fed anymore. Yeah. And so I felt, I felt like that wasn't, I'm not putting a blame on anything. And, uh, but I felt it was my responsibility really, if I recognized that to do something about it. So yeah, um, mm. instead of following a nice tidy career path, I mean, that's what I've always done though. I've just at, at that moment gone, <laughs> Uh, maybe it's the surfer in me um, with the risk taking. I don't know. Well, well, what but what it gets, gets you... back to the art of realizing Sorry. that's a huge part of myself. I had completely sidelined and hadn't painted in over a year. And that okay. for me was like alarm bells. So my kind of two indicators are, am I getting enough time in the water? Like when was the last time I surfed? And then the other one is, which, which is usually I need to be in the water at least a couple of times a week. If I've gone a week, it's probably, it's a bad sign. And then when was the last time I painted? And I was like, well, that, that was a year. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> uh, it's not that I, you know, but you can't do everything all at once is the other thing. Um, and so it was just prioritizing my art um, became a big motivator, actually. Mm. And not that I intend to actually do anything with it other than I just knew I needed to create this creative space to reconnect with that part of myself. Otherwise, it can very easily be lost. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I'm just wondering about, um, you know, you said you didn't want to blame anybody, which is understandable, but like, what if we do blame? <laughs> what, like, I, I just see this time and time again where amazing people end up mm -hmm. quitting their jobs because they're being pushed into like a, a very kind of production line way of operating that is, is based on not always wise or sensible KPIs and milestones. And like, it's, it's, a, it's a factory, it's a factory type way of, of achieving change. And it's not necessarily the best way. And it doesn't always take into account the need for human pauses where we need to breed or explore, or read or create. Um, I, I think that's just the world of work, perhaps where it's gone and people then end up getting burnt out. And so often, and I include myself again in, in this uh, spectrum where we end up leaving and going back onto the margins, if you like. And maybe that's where we belong. I don't know. <laughs> but but yeah, what, yeah. If, what if organizations were to fully embrace that spirit, uh, then everybody could be winning here that you don't end up having these um, organiz organizations that claim to be or are making change, but aren't really radical and aren't, trans aren't transforming anything. They're actually just recreating the, the dominant paradigm in it with a nicer guys and i see this in the non-profit sector all the time yeah okay. they just become kind of mirrors of the the state or the corporate entities um that, that, that they're not like fostering human connection or happiness hmm. another another rant of mine here no it's so true i mean i'm not the only one it's a conversation i've had you know with colleagues of mine and it's typically happens to those of us who you know, is in these kind of, you know, fixed term contracts where postdoctoral research fellows, there is a real hierarchy um, within academia as well, but probably throughout business. But I think with academia, it's, it's a lot more um, structured and, and very siloed. And there is less, I suppose, in a way, flexibility um, to... I don't want to say progress, but yes, yeah, so you're in a kind of precarious position. You don't actually really have a position of power, even though you might have been there a long time. Um, at least that's how it feels. And so that would need to change. You know, it's like we're, we are on the margins, even within the system. Okay. And then you think, well, what's the best way to affect change? If I try to do it from the inside out, I'm going to totally burn myself <laughs> or alienate myself. Mm -hmm. And then if you kind of jump outside of it and I've, I've been, you know, both, both sides, Outside of it too, you're almost, you're, you're so isolated. Um, you, you lose a lot of the supports. Um, so I'm curious about, is it possible <laughs> without totally stretching myself? Can you, can you create, is there a space in between? There has to be like this, this middle way. And I think there is, there, there are interesting things I'm seeing happen. Like another um, project on the horizon is with, um, the Eden Project in, in Cornwall, who set up Eden International, um, kind of founded by Sir Tim Smith. But they're really interested in looking at, I suppose, in a way, a more radical approach to how we look at these global challenges, how we think about education, how we learn, um, and in, in, alongside our connection with um, the environment. And 
So I'm wondering, it's what I'm trying to get at is like how it is time to create these new collaborations and partnerships and there's definitely enough of us now I feel that are thinking differently and in a way it's like well what if we all just got together <laughs> and tried it out you know like mm. a great big social experiment and I think it's time to really do that to take to take risks and um, to fully I, in a way it's like we're kind of making a mistake if we think we can figure it all out or solve all the problems in in this this moment but it's about how do you create this new process of change and in a way it speaks to a book i was reading by rebecca solnit um just republished recently i have it here that have you read that one very hope in the dark no brilliant and on on the topic of hope as well i find it really interesting because i i kind of went through a phase thinking maybe hope hope might be a bit useless <laughs> But how she, I just wanted to share how she describes how hope is not about what we expect. It is an embrace of the essential unknowability of the world. So this is embracing the unknown is actually where like the hope lies. And I just, I don't know, I really like that because I feel like that's constantly what you're having to do as a surfer. <laughs> Embracing the unknown, unknowing of when the next wave will come. Um, <laughs> Um, but there's, you know, preparation that happens while you're waiting for the next wave to come, right? Love it. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think that's a good note to end on, Iski, is this idea, because, I mean, we all, in many ways, uh, globally, politically, socially, environmentally, existentially, we're, we're in the dark as to we never know. And, and I, I think, like to just kind of walk forward or, or even swim forward into that unknown, but without fear to, to kind of embrace the ebb and the flow as you've been speaking so, so wisely to, um, it's been fantastic to spend this time <laughs> with you. And um, yeah, l I look forward to uh, the next adventure as to where, where all of this uh, brings all of us really. Um, yeah. It, it, it feels like it's, um, it's all about adventure and uh, exploration, and uh, it sounds like that's what you've signed up for. And keep keep surfing those waves um, without using too many cliches now. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, just best of luck with your book, Iski. And I hope everything goes great with the launch and everything. And look forward to supporting it when it comes out. Thank you. Yeah, likewise with yours. <laughs> Thanks, Iski. Hi folks, if you enjoyed that conversation with Eski, please do share it where you can, rate and review the podcast, all that thing, spread the word far and wide. The podcast is also available on all the main podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple, Podcast Addict, Acast, I don't know, there's so many of them now, but it should be up on all the main ones, SoundCloud as well, and YouTube. Um, so if you want to support the ongoing podcast development work, chip in, fuel the fire, put fuel in the fire at loveandcourage.org, takes two minutes. On, uh, once off or monthly, $5, 5 euro, 10, 20, whatever it is, it all matters and is appreciated. Uh, and again, the book is Hitching for Hope, A Journey into the Heart and Soul of Ireland. All the info is at hitchingforhope.com. That's it, folks. Thanks for tuning in. It's great to see you all. Great to connect with you. Lots of love and I look forward to sharing the next podcast soon.